Victor Paz was a former director of the Archaeological Studies Program of the University of the Philippines. He finished a BA and MA in History from the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy and became interested in archaeology. He obtained a PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge in the UK. He was instrumental in the creation of ASP and single-handedly ensured the strengthening of the discipline after his PhD. Dr. Pass, or may I call you Victor? Oh, <laughs> All right. of course, call me okay. Victor. Please. So you majored in history. That right. was uh, mm -hmm. you had a, as I said, you had a BA and an MA. Why did you shift to archaeology? Well, because I was a serious student of history, and I was lucky. I was in the department of history before it became formally Department of Kasaysayan, and it was a uh, it was a time when there was so much uh, intellectual ferment in the department from undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and, uh, and at that time, uh, we became very serious students of historiography. So we were very philosophical, philosophical with our history. And then um, Zio Salazar came in the picture and introduced Pantayong Pananao. And uh, at the time, we were thinking that, well, there's no more problem about the uh, framework for the study of Philippine history. So the question is, how do we go beyond the 16th century when you have a scarcity of documents? And so I thought, well, the best way is really to study through uh, material culture, which was really in the realm of archaeology. But I was very naive, of course, at the time. No? But uh, I was very excited about the idea of studying archaeology. But there was no institution at the time that uh, really formally trained people to become archaeologists. But there was a institution, a national one, that in, were solely doing archaeological fieldwork, and that's the National Museum. And lucky for me, the people there were very welcoming, uh, Willie Ronquillo, Sandy Salcedo, and uh, I made sure that every summer, every uh, semester break, I will volunteer in archaeological excavations run by the National Museum. So that's how it started, more or less. So it's um, from an academic perspective. Uh, do you have other reasons or other influences that help you decide to consider archaeology? I was always interested in history. I was always interested in things that, I, that fascinate me, that I wasn't... Uh, really, uh, uh, I didn't know the answers. And, uh, and so when it came to uh, Philippine history, there was another uh, component that was very important, and that's, uh, and I would say, I was an activist too. So we were very interested in transforming society, Philippine society for the better, uh, in a very structural way at the beginning. And uh, I, I was a believer that if uh, we know more, we might be able to uh, uh, create, perhaps, a better future. Uh, you, so yeah. that was my thinking. Yeah, that. you said we. Who were your peers at this time? <laughs> well, at the time, there are, I would say, gener several generations, but UP was, and UP is still, uh, such an environment where uh, you have several, you, you benefit from close interaction, uh, cheek to jowl, with people who are much older than you and people who are just a bit younger than you. And, uh, and there was a, a ferment, I would say, uh, and I was lucky that way, that um, I took advantage of that ferment. Uh, I'm talking about the early 80s, uh, throughout the 80s, and, um, and the early 90s. So, so that's the reason why uh, it was uh, almost um, handed to me, you know, the, the situation that I could uh, uh, benefit from being in the university and, uh, and do uh, what I want to do to pursue in the future. You think living in UP, growing up and living in UP and having a mother who is also in the academe helped you? Definitely, definitely. As a young, as a young boy, I grew up in a street full of children of my age, just a bit older, just a bit younger. And uh, the, the, the next block, the two blocks away, were also filled with children. And uh, our street were, were boys like, uh, you know, like boys can be, like really normal boys, uh, but children of academics, 
and non-academic personnel. Uh, then the, the two uh, adjacent streets are uh, more s serious children, uh, uh, the, the nerds, I will say, and most of them became uh, medical doctors and uh, 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 the other uh, one is already one is the dean of the College of Arts and Letters now, and she was a much a bit younger than me, and uh, so it was an environment uh, really uh, very conducive for children to play, and then uh, we can go into anyone's household and uh, play in anyone's yard. We didn't have any fences in those days, and we can play at night, and uh, uh, it was a wonderful childhood in camp, in, inside the campus. It's been a very happy one Oh, also. very happy, very, and then, but I did also realize later, later in high school, that we were uh, very privileged. I always thought that every, high, uh, every household had a library, until I went to a, a house of a, of a classmate in high school, outside UP, which didn't even have a single book, it didn't have a library, it said, and, and that I was taken aback by that. Because all the houses in UP campus uh, had libraries, you know, kahit yung simple encyclopedia Britannica lang, no? But like full libraries, and so that was um, interesting, but it was a reflection later in life that uh, we, it was an advantage to grow up in the university uh, campus at that time. And, uh, and my experience is not unique. And if you ask anyone who grew up inside a campus in those days, from the 60s to, uh, to the 80s, they will tell you the same story, you know? That the, it's the, uh, the ferment, the un, um, unintentional ferment of just cr uh, close proximity with families who are uh, also coming from academia. You know? Okay, going back to archeology, span can you describe uh, to us, uh, the first time you encountered or met the archaeologists from the National Museum. Oh, I was uh, awed by. It was a group of very macho men. You know, and, uh, was that remember, positive or negative? That was positive okay. at the time because I, I was also a young uh, cocky man at that time, and the uh, and the romance of the field, uh, and uh, and and they knew they knew their stuff. Uh, they knew how to do field work. And, uh, and I learned a lot from, um, from interacting with them as a, as a novice. And, um, and I think that was very positive. But later on, of course, I realized that it was also limiting and limiting. Uh, because, uh, and it was a, also an observation of the museum, that uh, it was a revolving door when it came to researchers. They would get very young, uh, women, men from anthropology, from the UP, but the, most of them won't last. It, it became too limiting at the end, this culture of machismo. And uh, so that was a lesson, which later on we applied to the ASP, you know, to, to try not to make it that way anymore. Babalikan ko yung machismo na yan. So, so you just... You, it was your own initiative to go to the museum and talk to people and ask where you can volunteer. Yes, yes. So where did you volunteer? What were the field works? Where were the field works? And what were the projects? Well, from the top of my head, I will say I volunteered. Uh, in those days, the museum didn't want to excavate near Manila. Uh, so we were so far away. Panutungan uh, in Mindanao will be my favorite. Uh, a long excavation. Uh, there was one in um, Batangas. Uh, there was one in uh, Sambales, of course. Uh, so you were volunteering at the National Museum while doing your master's at yes, the yes. Department of History? Uh, I was doing my master's, then I finished my master's, and then I did a, uh, I enrolled in Philippine Studies. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yes, I did. I was waiting for... Uh, uh, and this is what I tell our students. Because I know that I graduated. I graduated yeah. from BA, uh, BA Linguistics, and you come from your master's. From my master's. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I saw you in the yeah. crowd. <laughs> but uh, you see, uh, but it was very, it was not a, it was very awkward for me because it, my mother was the dean at that time. You know? But uh, but it was good. So Ziu Salazar was the chairman of the department when I graduated from my master's, uh, or my no, my undergraduate, and. Um, and he was very influential, I have to say, in my intellectual growth. And, but the, uh, the, the idea of, 
of linking with a museum uh, really um, enriched my my view of the field. I I, I was I, I suppose it was the adventure streak in me. Oh, let me just say, when I was growing up, we we camped all over the UP campus, no? and I we didn't realize why some of the parents sometimes uh, we were already camping here, no? where well, this place here, no? here near. Uh, where this building here is now situated and but then there were many informal settlers also so we will be moved by the parents to another camp place at the back of NSRI and all but it was like uh, we love uh, doing those outdoor stuff and, and and then so the field for me was always a uh, a, uh, a place of uh, of adventure and, and awe and uh, learning you know? What was the best uh, experience you had as a volunteer the, with the National Museum Archaeologist? Well, let me see. My best experience, I suppose, would be um, I was never very lucky in excavations. I always, they will always give me a place and nothing will come out. But my, my best experience is in a place where we were digging a very rich uh, burial site and nothing came, came out of my my, my, the place where I was excavating, that the museum was very kind enough to move me to a place where I could experience excavating. Where was this? This was in Panutungan. Panutungan. And Angel Bautista was uh, the kind person who did that. And, uh, but that was a good lesson for me because I realized it didn't really matter if I found anything myself. No? It was uh, a thing of, well, I was happy that others were finding things and I was fascinated by that. And I was always given, I was like, uh, I never really excavated anything that was super fantastic in any of those excavations. But I was always fascinated and happy that the excavation in general was good. So I think that was good for me, you know, because it didn't matter now whether, um, so it, it, it kind of trained me to, to appreciate things in a holistic manner. Not, it's not all about uh, what, I myself excavate, but what everyone, it's an, a collective thing. You know? So that was a very good lesson, I think. So looking back, how did you, how did you, ass how did you assess the discipline at that time? When you were volunteering at the National Museum, when there was no ASP yet, there was only Dr. Dizon, who was the, yes. was the only one with the PhD just, at that time. Newly just, minted, he yes. just came back in uh, 1987. He just came back from the University of Pennsylvania. At the time, I, I didn't have very strong opinions about it, except that uh, I knew it had to develop. And, and I think that is how UP helped. Because somehow, everyone who was senior to me uh, uh, realized there was a need to develop archaeology. And what was lacking at the time was that the discipline, when it was boosted in 1977, with more items in the National Museum, more resources. Uh, very quickly, by the late 80s, those who were very young in 77 were not very young anymore in 1980, but they could not mentor because the National Museum was not built to mentor people. So they were uh, items and there were limited items. And so they were getting old without tra training the next generation. And so this is something that people must know, the leadership of the museum then, the more senior members of the discipline of archaeology realized this. Willie Ronquillo, uh, uh, more senior than Willie, was uh, Fred Evangelista, um, uh, Jesus Peralta, no, uh, Sandy Salcedo, and so they, they supported the efforts of the university to boost archaeology in the UP. And that's why the ASP eventually was created to, uh, to to uh, address this big gaping uh, lack of structure in uh, training generations of, of people to follow through and develop the discipline. And that's why I, I suppose the ASP was, you know, was timely and its development, its, uh, its progress and its success is very important to the practice of archaeology. Is this studies. the reason why you left the Philippine Studies uh, program and uh, decided to do a PhD in archaeology? I was just parking there. Okay. I, I was really going for 
one scholarship, uh, applying for scholarships, uh, several scholarships, and, uh, and, uh, and programs abroad. Because I knew as soon as the ASP was built formally, I need to go abroad no? uh, and then uh, uh, and study and then come back and help in its, uh, in its building. So that was a very deliberate act in my, in my part. But uh, having said that, uh, when, again, when Zio Salazar was dean of CSSP, he, uh, he tried his best with Popin Kovar of anthropology to, to uh, earmark a portion of Philippine studies to, uh, uh, well, at least to offer courses that uh, is dedicated to archaeology. And so, we, and so I, um, I enrolled in those courses. There were at least two courses, if I remember correctly. And therefore, that's uh, something that uh, uh, was uh, very important. But it show, it's like a stopgap solution to the problem. We knew that it, there has to be a more dedicated uh, program for, for Did this you program. apply to different universities I, or just uh, to Cambridge? Uh, no, I applied to different universities. I applied to SOAS, UCL, Cambridge. Uh, but I didn't apply in any of the U.S. universities. Why did you choose a U.K. Uh, oh, that's a again, British deliberate. university and why Cambridge? Because the older ones, right, all got their degrees and training uh, in the U.S., right? And I knew that if we're going to build an institution, it would be great that there are other uh, traditions that we can bring in, and, then, uh, and so we will have a better uh, ferment, or we, we can learn from the best practices of the, uh, the United States uh, tradition and the European tradition. And uh, anyway, I went for Cambridge because, well, it's a name, no? I didn't know anyone from Cambridge. I didn't know all the big boys and girls, right? But I just went for it. And uh, I didn't regret it at all. It was your decision, or did Zoom sell us or because you, oh, no, no, you no. mentioned him several, his name several times. Oh, but he hated me by that. Oh, he hated you. <laughs> because I wasn't a follower. <laughs> but I respected him, and you know, now we're very good friends, and we collaborate a lot. But in those days, uh, it was different. It was different. Oh, no, no, not at all. No. If it was uh, there, he would have said, go to France, you know, rather than to the UK. It was my decision. It was a decision. Sino ko makusap sa iyo before leaving for Cambridge? Because ah. I, I remember before I left for Cambridge, he gave me a pep talk and said, you should return. Oh, me? Uh, oh, well, that kind of philosophy of uh, you must return, that's my mother. No? Uh, it was very clear because we, UP at that time was unlucky when uh, a lot of our colleagues were uh, getting scholarships and they were uh, rescinding those their, their uh, commitment to UP and not coming back. And then that, that destroyed the, uh, the faculty development of that discipline. So th that, that left a mark uh, in me. And we were de developing the discipline, remember, in those days, Grace. But, <clears throat> but you know who really um, was one of those who talked to me before I left? Randy David. And Randy said, you know, if I had a ch uh, uh, Because Randy in those days already uh, could have gone to Oxford rather than Manchester, but Oxford wanted him to be, to go back to undergrad. And he said, no, no, you know, I want to do, um, I want to do uh, graduate work, you know, I'm, I'm already a faculty member, etc. But, but the lesson that he, he, he and then this is what I tell people even now, uh, you don't go to a place because of the big boys and girls, because of a known professor, you go to a place because of its environment. And that was his lesson, uh, that was his lesson. Uh, and he learned it in, the, in, in a more roundabout and negative way. But it was very good advice and it's sound advice that I will always give people. Don't go to a place because there's a very, very famous professor there. Go because of the environment. Huh? Yeah. So, so in Cambridge, it never crossed your mind to stay for a year or two after you graduate? No, not at all. Even if no. you fell in love with Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found love there, yes. yes. Um, uh, I, uh, it was very clear to me. I, I, was, uh, I, I knew that was the last moment in my life where I will not be responsible for anything else but myself. Because I knew when I finished, when I come, came back, uh, it will be all just responsibilities and institution building, attempts to that. And so when I was there, I, uh, I left 
oh, it was, I lived a life of Riley. Really. That was a wonderful life for me. Uh, I just absorbed everything. I, I always told myself before I left, this is a long ethnography. A long ethnography. And then I... Five years, yeah, right? Yeah, you five in years. Cambridge, so, because five I did years. an MPhil and then a PhD. And, uh, yeah. So it was good. And I never, it never crossed my mind to go for a postdoc or stay there. No, no, no. I, I knew it. This, this is my place. So what did you learn in Cambridge that you wanted to apply in UP and in ASP? Several things, several things. I learned, in fact, uh, and they were good lessons because I think the results were, were not too bad. First, it's all about the culture of the academic institution. Not, like I said, not the big boys or girls. Uh, it has to be a dynamic one. You have to give your community, especially your students, access to to facilities. It's not, uh, academic work is not nine to five. No? So, so you have to have free access to uh, facilities no matter how scarce they are. And, um, and uh, that's a very important lesson. Uh, you have to make sure that your faculty is international. Uh, very important lesson. If it's a monocultural faculty, then the default would be the base culture and I think that's one problem that we have in many disciplines in our university. If we are all Pinoys, then uh, at the beginning, when you're young, you know, you're very open, but you are not too open when you're a senior to a very young faculty member who criticizes you from the same culture. If it's a, someone who's not Pinoy, you'll say, this person may not have any good manners, but this person is very good at what, what this person does. And so you will give that person more uh, fly, uh, leeway. And then, uh, and then the only uh, interaction you will have is in a academic way. Uh, and, and I think that's very healthy. And, uh, and you don't have to be a very rich institution to be successful. In fact, it's good uh, not to have everything. Uh, you served as director of the archaeological studies program for three terms, so that's yeah. nine years. Uh, actually, ten years. Oh, ten. Less, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what were the challenges you faced, and how did you overcome uh, those challenges in terms of developing ASP as an institution, yeah. developing the discipline, mm -hmm. archaeology, and of course, uh, maintaining or making sure that the students stay and finish uh, their course or their degree? The first challenge was for, to create a healthy level of self-confidence for people who are studying the discipline. And I realized that the best way to do that was to uh, get them to uh, uh, understand that uh, it's not that difficult to publish. And so we created TestPit, uh, hukai, you know, uh, uh, publishing uh, venues for people to make them productive, to make them have a sense that uh, what they're doing is worthwhile because it's not a uh, derivative. Uh, so that's one uh, important thing. Second is to uh, create, a big challenge was to create a faculty. Uh, I was the only one who was full-time uh, and, and, uh, and that was a big challenge. But uh, then I had the naivety to think that if people were just productive, then there will be no more uh, replication of all this uh, of old culture of, of, neg of negativity or factionalism or tendencies of. But then I realized the flip side of not being productive, which generates that kind of uh, culture, is the sensitivity of of colleagues that are too productive and they get slighted easily. So it's, it's a very hard balance to maintain. But the bottom line is to create a culture that sees the community as not their own or a, a, a replica of themselves, a clone of themselves, but to really to, uh, to treat the institution as a separate uh, entity altogether from the individuals who are in it. And that is a challenge. And I realized that 10 years is too long to run an institution. And I was always kid people and, and half kidding that if I carried on being an administrator for another five years, I will start 
believing the myth that I am the institution, and that's not going to be healthy. We were very lucky at the ASP because uh, I took over uh, Bong Dison, who's very different from me, myself. Then Mandy Miharis took over the um, administration from myself, who's again very different from me. And you are very different from Mandy or myself or Bong. And so our institution is very healthy in that way. But can you imagine if it was run by one individual for too long? No? that this is not going to happen. Uh, this is the reason why we are very dynamic as an uh, academic institution. So while you were administrator, you also had several research projects. I did, yes. Uh, yeah. One in Palawan, and of course you handled several of the field schools. Seven, in, eight years uh, All of the, the field schools, I think, yeah. in Mindoro. So yeah. how did you Mindoro balance the being an archaeologist and being an administrator at the same time? It was not too difficult in those days because we were very small. No? But it was difficult, uh, nevertheless, because it's balancing your, uh, I suppose, your, your desire to, uh, to better the dynamics of an institution and its capabilities. And then uh, there's that part of you that you want to do your own research. So that was not too easy to do. And then on top of that, you have family life, right? And, uh, and that's also not difficult. Uh, if, if you ask what suffered between career, uh, institution building, um, personal, I mean, academic uh, kudos, uh, institution building or family, I will say um, in those days, in hindsight, that uh, perhaps uh, family suffered a bit, right? And then the uh, personal kudos research suffered a bit. Uh, and. Uh, I was dedicated to the institution building. I, think that's I, I will not recommend that to anyone. Though. But that's the lesson that many of us uh, get from you. Always yeah. think of the institution and then Correct. everything else will yeah. follow. Remember what I always say, you know if a person is serious with what they're doing, if they, in a short period of time they, they become, they look old, you know? they hair-wise you know, and everything. And, uh, if they look very young at the end of it, then they weren't serious about their, so <laughs> their what responsibility. Do you, what do you think are the essentials in developing the practice of archaeology in the Philippines? The essential will be the keep of, uh, I suppose, the, the warm bodies. To gather uh, enough warm bodies interested in the, uh, in the development and transformation of discipline. Second is I suppose, and I've been, and you know this, the, we cannot do it by ourselves. There cannot be just one institution dedicated to the practice or the training of archaeologists in the Philippines. And, and therefore, we have to encourage uh, other universities to carry on, institutions at least. Uh, the National Museum, by its nature at the moment, that's not their purview. No, they, are, they are the ones who uh, regulate us. But the, those who institutions to train, we must encourage, control other universities to, to create programs too. So that's very important. And, uh, and I will say, and this is hard to explain, we must maintain a culture of, a positive culture, academic culture, um, collegiality, uh, which is hard to maintain because it's in a kind of paradox, our discipline, or any academic discipline for that matter, encourages individuality and the uh, celebration of an individual's uh, 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 success. At the same time, in our case, we are a discipline that cannot do our research by ourselves. We are by nature collaborative. So balancing that is, is a hard, hard feat to do. Earlier I asked you what was your assessment of the discipline when you were volunteering at the National Museum. And now, what's your assessment of the discipline after 25 years? I think we have grown exponentially. Exponentially. Uh, when, uh, and and the, the matrix there will be like this. No? The amount of output a publication output we have. Uh, you are the first uh, product of ASP Grace for the masters, if you remember. 
uh, and that was a good one. And everyone read your, your thesis. So, uh, you can tell that by the cover of our, in the library where there's no more, you cannot read anymore the cover because people have been handling it so much. And then, um, and then since then, we have graduated people uh, formally in our program, uh, diploma, uh, masters, PhD. And then um, we are known, uh, very much known, anywhere in the world now. We are, uh, uh, we are at, the, at the top of, of our discipline in the region. Uh, and, uh, and this is one lesson I learned in, in Europe. You know you're doing something right when people come to visit you. So people from your discipline will go out of the way and come and visit your institution. And we have had that. Yeah. Uh, so people come and like, like a beeline and then we, they give lectures. So you know that there's something good going on in our discipline. Right? ASP has many collaborators from across the world, from, in, from Europe, from Australia, Southeast Asia. Um, how do we maintain, how do you think ASP should maintain that collaboration? Well, by the nature of it, then a collaboration should be beneficial for both sides. And that can be maintained by just carrying on with this idea that we are, we don't have a chip on our shoulders, you see. Uh, that's, that's another very early lesson. Huh? Uh, we, we, when we practice before, somehow we thought that uh, our colleagues from outside were better than us. Of course they are, in many ways, huh? uh, in terms of their facilities and their experience, etc. So how we augmented that in the early days was we never had field collaborative research with them without a substantial number of our graduate students with us. So we have many of us out in there. Second, we never thought that we were inferior to our colleagues. And so if they set a cadence, we follow that cadence. No? And I think that's very important. Uh, never collaborate with people that you cannot follow their cadence. No? Uh, coll collaborate with people that you, uh, who, are, who have the sa same kind of work ethics, perhaps, same interests, you know? and uh, that is always going to be a, a co will come up with very positive results. And, uh, and so collaboration wasn't very difficult for us, uh, and, and that's why we have so many collaboration, uh, collaborative research with many, many nationalities through the years. Uh, you have your own, I have my own, uh, and our other colleagues do. Yeah. Do you think we need to replicate facilities abroad or create our own? Ah, oh, good question. You see, uh, why replicate if we can get it uh, by collaborating with others? Uh, I think what we have to create are uh, facilities that no other institutions, or it would be difficult to, to, get, to get collaborative uh, work with those other institutions, we do that. But it again boils down to the individuals who are doing the research. And so uh, I am confident that uh, any, any one of us, if they have a research interest and they need certain kinds of equipment, they will find ways of getting access to those equipment or specialization. If it needs to be a local collaboration or a building of capabilities, then so be it. If it's simply just tapping colleagues who are in other places and that can be done by our colleagues, then so be it. And that's, I think, what's happening now. No? Okay. So in terms of since ASP is celebrating 25, 25th year, um, is there anything that you think you should have done differently while you were an administrator? Oh, it's a good question. Um, oh, let me see. Mm, I've had none, really. I've had. I think we maximize everything that, uh, in the conditions that we were faced with in those days. No? Uh, I think we should have been a school a long time ago. I think so. But I will be admitting it really now with all honesty 
that was pushing it too far because we didn't really have that, the critical mass of people. But in the last decade or so, I suppose we have enough faculty, enough students, enough output. I think we should transform into a, a proper school. Uh, and that's all. I, I, that, I think that's the only thing. Uh, but that's beyond our control anyway. Uh, that's beyond our control. So after 25 years, do you think we have reached a critical mass? Because I always hear you say critical mass. We, have. we need a critical mass to transform the minds of people regarding Aha, archaeology. That's a, that's a different matter. No? <laughs> a critical mass in transforming the institution to the next level. Uh, for example, a, a redefinition of what archaeology is. In my book, archaeology is heritage, but some of our colleagues will not agree with that. Uh, and the second part, is, but the question of whether we have reached a critical mass in transforming or influencing the way uh, other Filipinos think about the past, about their heritage, we haven't reached that at all. For the simple reason, we are a singular institution, even though we're UP. And between the National Museum and UP, that is not enough for the rest of the country. We need an ASP in Mindanao, in Visayas, you know, in Northern Luzon, in Southern Luzon, and more ASPs will be, that will be a critical mass. You know? Something that Robert Fox celebrated in the late 1960s when he thought uh, the future is bright for archaeology you know, and everything, but uh, unfortunately, it didn't pan out that way because the institutions didn't manage to uh, uh, sustain their programs. And then there were personal, it was a very personal practice of archaeology. So if I understand correctly, you say in terms of research, we've reached a critical mass. Research-wise, okay. we have a problem. But how do we make research, archaeology, archaeological research relevant to non-archaeologists or non-academics? Oh, yes. Because I think that's one of the greatest challenges that we face as archaeologists indeed because we study the past but how should how will this be relevant to us in the to other people in the present well that's why i think to see archaeology as at the level of default as a heritage discipline is a crucial uh, thinking because then uh, it becomes our responsibility to create narratives that are not only relevant to our uh, colleagues, but are also uh, easily trans translatable to a language that is understandable to communities. So I've, I've been experimenting on this, and, um, but I never see myself uh, uh, proposing it as a uh, best practice across the, the country. But in my long-term projects in, uh, in Palawan, it's on its 17th year in um, the Bonta Peninsula, on its 11th year, 12th year. I, I, th I thought it was easy just to create a heritage, uh, uh, change the mindset of people by just sharing our information. Um, but it's harder than I thought. You know? It takes a long time. So we're doing our, our best to do this, but only because I think somewhere uh, along the way, in the future, someone might be able to study this or look at it and then take the best out of it. And maybe they will be the people who will be able to create all these models, all these initiatives that can be um, adopted by the government, by state institutions, by private institutions. Uh, that is my hope. Yeah? But as far as I'm concerned, at the moment, I, uh, it's like a petri dish. No? I'm just within my petri dish of my own research interests, uh, mentoring uh, the area, uh, and then uh, trying to create or see if we can uplift or transform at a higher level the consciousness of people. Because my thinking is, uh, it's all very well that you uh, enhance the economic conditions of basic communities living around archaeological sites, but that's, that's not sustainable. As soon as they become wealthy, they will uh, go somewhere else, those individuals who succeed. However, it's my thinking, if you lift their consciousness about uh, their sense of place, sense of belonging, and, and, the, and what we can offer, 
substantially can do that, then they will have a sense of pride of being there. And so they will not, they will be happy living where they are. Where, even when their economic conditions have uh, improved substantially. That's my thinking. Yeah. So uh, you, refer to, sorry, you, are, you refer to people who live uh, within the sites you work on? Around the area yes. or at least yes. in, you know, how like about more, the, more local. How right? about the greater Filipino community? I'm afraid I'm not too optimistic. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not focused there. You know? Like I mentioned earlier, then I hope that someone else catch, catches this kind of this practice we're doing at a local level, and then maybe they can be more successful in doing that. Uh, but I, at this level, I'm, I'm more interested in the, in the effect, the local effect. So how long have you been practicing archaeology? Oh, since 1980, 1987, I suppose. 18. Okay, so if you compare yourself now with the young man that you were in the 1980s, did your passion, have your passions changed or your interests changed? My interests has, um, has deepened. My passion has also, has, is more profound. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my health and my body is not the man <laughs> 25, 30 years ago. And so the adventure part is all in the mind, out in the field, but it's not like before, you know. You know oh, there's a site up there. I, uh, you have to explore that. You can do that. No? Now you just say to the young man, oh, there's a site up there. Could you go there with my camera? <laughs> shoot, shoot, okay. <laughs> so that, that's the only difference. The, the, physic, the physical conditions of the individual has changed, but the mental, uh, the mental uh, passion, I don't think, has if anything, it has become more uh, uh, interested in all of this. No? So, uh, I, okay. No, no, I will just give you an example. Just last year, late last year, I was going to confirm all this. I'm interested in Agus and the River Valley, and I was, and I want to, I want to find temple sites, no? temple sites, and, or well, maybe the 10th century, 12th, 13th, no matter what. And there are reports of ruins, and so I went to these places, but boy, it was so difficult for me to track and everything. But it's what driven just by the mind to go there. And, uh, and of course, they didn't pan out well. They were all natural uh, formations, but that's still good. No? But I am still interested in all that, the, the discovery of things that, um, that perhaps will answer questions that we are uh, not sure of. The current answers are, are very vague. No? I'm, I'm still very interested in those things. So. so can you say that you've reached your goal? Oh, I'm already in the bonus points. No, uh, I'm, I, I have, uh, uh, for me as an individual, I've reached my goals, everything that uh, I wanted to do in life uh, years back. I'm, all of this is bonus for me. I, I live a very, very good life, I would say. <laughs> You're still in contact with Dr. Jesus Alasar. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, I am indeed. Um, uh, we're it's okay, you know. I mean, we collaborate and we argue a lot about many things. We our interests overlap, but we're we are like every, everyone else, like us. We have overlapping interests, but there are other interests that we have that are different from our overlapping interests. You think you will uh, retire from doing archaeology? Oh, you will no. stop. <laughs> My view, is, um, my view is I will kill over doing what I want to do. You know? that's, my, that's my dream. You know? uh, I, I don't think uh, I'm one of those people, uh, and I've, in UP there's so many of us like this, that we, we will just like to do what we want to do until the day that we stop uh, breathing. That, that's how it is. What would be your advice to a young scholar who wants to do a degree, wants to do archaeology? Well, not only in archaeology, you just, you just follow, uh, follow and pursue your passion. Uh, and, uh, but for me, when, and this is a question that many people ask me, what is your favorite site? You know, what is your biggest uh, discovery? What is your favorite discovery? And, uh, and my answer to that has always been, well, it's, well, first, it was so very difficult to answer. But, I realize that for me, what is interesting 
is to go to a place, to investigate a question, to excavate a landscape with a question in mind, and then that question buds out, uh, uh, multiplies to other questions. If an archaeological site or a research question is a singular question that is answered and it stops there, then it's a boring site for me. So it's the budding out. It's the, it's the creation of new questions coming out with your encounter with, with the original questions that you ask yourself while you are there, right? And for me, that, and that's why I'm not interested in time depth. I'm not in, I am happy that it's very old. I also don't mind if it's just 100 years old, you know? It is the questions that you ask yourself and, and the questions that come out of it after answering the initial question. That is the fascinating thing for me. So it's hard to get bored, uh, hard to get bored. You also said, like, of course, archaeology is teamwork, it's collaboration. Um, how do you view your students and how do you, think, what's the best way to mentor your students? The best way is not to dictate what they should be passionate about or what questions they want to answer or, or pursue or their research. The best way for me is to get from those individuals what, what actually is interesting for them and then just to help them develop those interests, provide them with facilities, with, uh, with uh, potentials, open windows and doors for them rather than get their hands and then carry them in one direction. For me, that is, that is the better way. Uh, and therefore, people will, will develop or will find their own tracks no? and paths, and we be, will become independent uh, researchers, scholars, or, or students, and hope they all become they all stop not being students of, of any uh, interest they have, especially in archaeology. Do you still think the macho culture is prevalent in not ASP anymore. Not anymore. or in Philippine archaeology? Oh, no, no. We have transformed a lot. And I will say the, uh, the, uh, the period will be somewhere in uh, the early not years, maybe about 2008 or 2009. Oh, timeline. <laughs> yes, yes. It's because um, now all genders are represented in the discipline of archaeology. And when we, we demonstrated that you don't have to be a hardcore field person to carry on the discipline, you can be someone who will be based in the lab. You can be someone who is a curator in a museum and still practice archaeology. You can be someone who can just write. No? And even out in the field, you know, you've run a lot of excavations, Grace. And, uh, and there are more, uh, all, there, therefore, it's not a baseline anymore. If anything, in, and I think in our discipline, the uh, endangered uh, gender uh, representation will be the macho. So in my thinking, no? but I, I don't want that to be uh, uh, extinct. I think all the, all the tendencies should be there, but I don't want it also to be dominant anymore. It is counterproductive at the end of it. No? In all you have accomplished as an archaeologist, um, what, what do you think embody pagiging scholar ng bayan or being of service to the nation? Ah, this is a very important subtle point and many people don't get it. You can be a very uh, acerbic critic of government. You can even be a critic of the state, of the nation, of the concept of the nation state. But doesn't mean that you are not a champion of Filipino culture. And so, in my view, it's a subtle but very important point to underscore that when we talk, when we study the past, we are studying ancestral Filipinos. They're not Filipinos yet. But if we learn more about them, 
then it will make us learn, understand ourselves better now. But it doesn't mean because it is ancestral, it's all good. We don't want to go back chopping each other's heads, right? But it's important to understand that. We don't want to go back to old traditions of, uh, of our cosmologies and uh, or, or raiding, slave raiding, etc. But it's important to understand that. And these are our ancestral cultural uh, roots. And that is a very important point. To understand who we are as a collective of individuals from different ethno-linguistic groups, but with so many commonalities. And so even now we may be nationalists, but when we are beyond nation states, for example, in the future, it doesn't um, uh, unravel the idea that we are a collective of cultures that have a very strong commonality of history. And I think that is important to underscore, but very difficult to explain. And I don't think I explained it well. <laughs> Kailangan maintindihan ng mga non-archaeologists or even non-academics why uh, paano tayo nakakatulong? <laughs> well, you know, that is the problem. You know? I mean, we're we not very good trans, uh, popular transmitters of knowledge. We need people to, we need to collaborate with people who are very good at that. Uh, we, when we were young, uh, we were in cocky. We thought we can do everything, make a documentary, write scripts, uh, be popular. Then uh, we were disabused of that idea very quickly. Uh, when our results ended up looking like they're uh, high school projects, and, uh, and it was really bad. <laughs> There's a reason why people are good. There are other disciplines who are specializing on, on popularization, etc. And, and that is my critique also of uh, institutions that demand from their especially academic institutions, demand from their basic researchers to popularize their own basic research. That's, that's a very hard, very, very few people in the world can do that. Very, very few people, in my, my thinking. I think it takes a different set of skills and talent. And, and personality. You have to have all of that, you know? Uh, and to demand that from everyone is quite a, I mean, a high level of demand. Idealistic, apparent. <laughs> Well, yes, I think so. I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic about uh, many things, and I'm not never pessimistic about it. And I think um, let's talk about let's say uh, our university. Our university is much much better now than than what it was in the past. Huh? I think we are now truly a research university, uh, and. We're transforming the culture, uh, the academic culture that is um, flowing uh, underneath the different uh, disciplines we have. I believe in our lifetime we will see a truly interdisciplinary uh, research approach to any uh, research question that we put ourselves, our minds to it. Eh? And uh, that's going to happen within our lifetime. We've been talking about this since the 80s, but now. There are, uh, I think we, we, we're going to get there. No? The very reason that the very uh, existence of the ASP is a good example of that. Uh, before, you cannot get a degree in UP if you're not based in a college, and college are disciplinal. And then now we have the MC, we have the ASP, you know, we have so many other programs. Uh, we have the Open University, where you don't have to be based in a discipline in a college to be given a degree. And that is, for me, a 21st century direction. Okay. Given the relevant areas, what steps did you take in creating a dynamic culture, not just in, within ASP, but across the region? Okay. Well, it was clear to me very early on that we have to be a plug, link to various networks. And uh, there are many ways to do this, but we were lucky because uh, the people who came before our generation were already linked to networks. And uh, for example, the Indo-Pacific uh, Prehistory Association, which is like our, as you know, it's like our Olympics. Uh, every four years, we have this big conference so where everyone sees it's everyone who's working in the region uh, across the Pacific, Southeast Asia, Southern China, 
uh, attend that conference. And, um, and we've always been a nominal participant in, in those conference. But in uh, 2006, we hosted it here at UP. And we, uh, we did a, you know, we had a very uh, successful conference and, and people liked what we did and, and people knew who we are. And from there, a lot of people developed their own networking. Uh, and then we also, and, and one example would be the uh, Erasmus Mundus network that was, that came out of that with our European colleagues, our French, uh, Italian, and Spanish colleagues, and uh, which uh, entailed uh, us hosting European students to do mobility in the Philippines, to experience excavating in the Philippines, and our students going to Europe to experience excavating in European archaeological sites. There's something about mobility that's very important. It's, uh, and we, I noticed this with our students. Once they experience this, they, you can see a change in their maturity, in their, in their intellectual maturity, and even in their social maturity. There, there, there's a substantial change. So mobility is very important uh, to provide this to our students. And then we encourage all of them to apply for all the small grants, excavations in Angkor Wat, as you know, the Singaporean uh, initiatives. And, uh, and then we encourage local collaboration to happen too. It is just unfortunate that we never really succeeded in uh, producing uh, like uh, master students, even on our honor students or uh, diploma students, I mean. Uh, from uh, Asian um, co countries. No? Uh, there are always, always there's inquiry, there's, there's um, interest, but it always boils down to resources. No? And, um, and we don't have enough infrastructural uh, facilities in the region to provide scholarship of that sort. And so what happens, we go to Europe where that there's still even now, the, the, uh, much reduced, but there's still uh, institutional support for our uh, and Southeast Asian uh, archaeologists to go there and, and study for many and get their degrees. So perhaps another, uh, not regret, but I see maybe a failure that uh, we never managed to produce a a Southeast Asian archaeologist, not Pinoy, uh, uh, in terms of formal degrees in the ASP. Maybe that's for the future. Uh, um, but again, networking is very important. How about multidisciplinary approaches? How important is that in uh, doing archaeology? Very important. There, uh, in, in a multidisciplinary approach, the way I see it, there's a, a question coming from a discipline and then that discipline then gathers specialists from other disciplines to try to answer that question. An interdisciplinary approach will be, there's a common question in the middle and different disciplines contribute to answer that question. So we have many examples of multi. Uh, a good example there will be how the um, our genetics, our population, our genetics uh, colleagues uh, retooled themselves to become uh, equipped to address questions of population genetics, right? And then later on to again contribute to research on ancient DNA. So for example, now we have um, uh, Dr. Mike Herrera who is specializing in ancient DNA of animal remains but collaborating now with uh, uh, Dr. Cora de Ungria uh, of, uh, of genetics, who, again, is someone who expanded and retooled and, and trained herself to new approaches to genetic studies beyond um, her initial training. And then we have, in, in, in that big project that they have now, we have people from linguistics, from history, addressing a common question, not generated from a singular discipline, but the common question about uh, us being 
uh, Pinoy's. No? So that is something that, if you, that is something that we dreamt of back in the 80s and even earlier than that, but now we can see an actual uh, practice of this uh, in, in research. In 2019, uh, the Philippines had the, the discovery of the century, so um, the Homo Luzinensis. And of course, a year or two before that, there was the Kalinga Rhino with indirect evidence of human activity at 700,000 years mm -hmm. ago. And then your studies in Palawan and in Agusan, Mindoro, and Katanawan. And of course, studies of, other, of, your, of our colleagues too in different parts of the Philippines. How do you think this all relate to understanding ourselves as Filipinos in terms of our identity and nation building? These sites are from different time periods, uh, different places in the Philippines. They yield the different artifacts. So how do they relate to present-day Filipinos in terms of identity and nation building? I, I see I, I, questions of understanding identity and nation building as two different concerns, although they overlap, of course. It's important to know who you are, uh, to be able to, be, uh, to contribute to nation building. But nation building, for me, is more of a a tactical uh, objective, uh, but the uh, knowing who we are uh, goes beyond that. And all of, any discovery that comes from basic research, I think, will contribute uh, both ways. Uh, for example, if we take the, uh, the discovery of the rhinoceros with cut marks and stone tools, and the uh, declaration and acceptance of the existence of another species of Homo, Homo lucinensis. These, uh, these are very important, very important f uh, discoveries and, uh, and, and, uh, and presentation of warrant to the idea that we, uh, as, a, as a, a population of modern humans in, islands, in, in the Philippine Islands, we are connected to the overall history of of humanity in the world at the very early stages of its uh, of transformation. And, uh, and I would say that uh, in nation building that can be used, of course, right? Uh, but more importantly, that and, and, and any kind of new information that will uh, in, enrich our understanding of the past will enrich the way we appreciate ourselves. And so these are things that are, that are, I would say, parallel concerns. You can be very much interested in nation building, and of course, maybe not too much interested in the detailings of, uh, that comes out of basic research. But I will argue that if you're interested in understanding who we are as a collective uh, through time as a people, the, then, um, the, the concern with knowing wh why, who are Pinoy's now, and why do we behave this way, will always uh, be further clarified with more synthesis of information coming from my basic research. And so this is something hard to, to appreciate if the timeline of people is very short, if it's like uh, sound bites, no? So, the super spectaculars get good sound bite. The mundane uh, results, right, don't get those sound bites. And maybe that's where we come in. When we write our synthesis books, which may not be that popular in writing, but when that comes out, then people can, can use it, right? Should you write in Filipino or English? Ah, you have to ask your audience very immediately. As a discipline, our lingua franca and is English. If you want to be read by your colleagues in any country, in any part of the world, if you write in English, that's our lingua franca. But if you say you want to directly engage uh, Filipinos, then you write in Filipino. Do you write for archaeologists or do you write for the Filipino people? It's a very good question. Normally, I write for archaeologists. 
But in the past, I've attempted to write uh, site reports in Filipino, but that is that, uh, it's a dilemma. No, it's a dilemma, definitely. Uh, but uh, definitely I write in Filipino if I want, if it's very clear to me, this is for the Filipino audience. Yeah. My, ne my coming book is written in Filipino, but it's social banditry. <laughs> not, not, there's materiality of culture, but it's, not more, it's more history than archaeology. But archaeologically, the books that I'm going to write will be mostly in English until the time that there will be more, um, I suppose, until I tell myself, uh, oh, no, no, this book is going to be written for, for, for Pinoy's rather than for the, the, pub, the, the academic archaeological community. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I know that many people will learn from uh, our discussion, from our uh, conversation. So, and we hope for the best um, regarding your, in terms of your research and in terms of uh, your health. Thank you very much, Grace.